Alrighty, welcome back. As we dive into our lecture number two on um, Gorman's chapter two, which is on translations. But before we dive back into um, the importance of translations, I want to encourage you to make sure that you read um, Blue Parakeet chapters three through five, which is about reading the Bible as a story. And so from that uh, reading, um, one of the important discussions that I'll have for you is this. I want you to read Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, a common passage where Jesus is tempted in the desert. And we're going to talk about how that passage applies. What's the meaning of that passage and how does it apply in a 21st century context? And so it might be surprising for you as you read McKnight, you'll get to read his view on this text. I'm interested in your views on uh, the meaning of Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Also, um, as you read in chapter 3 of McKnight, you're going to see some shortcuts to reading the Bible that are typical for people. And I want you to uh, um, tell me which shortcut is most prevalent for you, which one is most likely for you to uh, be guilty of taking that shortcut. For me, it's being a maestro, looking at the maestro Paul or the maestro Jesus and fitting everything else inside of that as opposed to letting each author stand on its own. And so it's important for you to look through those shortcuts and tell me uh, what shortcut you typically will take. And so it's important for you, just let me sum up some of Mike McKnight's Blue Parakeet, which is the foundation of everything that we're going to do in this class, which is this, the Bible's a story. The Bible's a story. It's not just a bunch of isolated theological statements. God is love. God is holy. God is this. It's stories about what God has done and who he is. And so the story makes it more interesting, but it's not a systematic theology. Haven't you at times wanted, God, could you have just laid out the most important points? Could you have put, put it in a, um, a, a Bible study format that had been a little bit easier for us? But for whatever reason, he chose to do it in a story. And so uh, as we start this, uh, our journey out, it's important to understand that a story has plot and it has characters and it has authors. And as we look at that, we need to understand how story works and how it changes how we interpret the Bible. And so um, make sure you read chapters 3 through 5, and um, I want you to interact with Matthew 1 through chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and then what shortcuts do you typically take when you read the Bible? All right, let's dive into translations, and um, believe, you, believe it or not, this is huge, and if you ever see yourself doing church work, if you ever pastor people, then translations are overwhelming for the guy or gal that sits in the pew. As they look to read the Bible, as the pastor says it's important for you to read your Bible and they go to a bookstore and try to find a Bible, can you imagine how overwhelmed they are with all the types, the teenage Bible, the woman Bible, the man Bible, the military Bible, the every kind of Bible you can think of, the life application Bible, the Ryrie Study Bible, the John MacArthur Bible, the every kind of Bible you could ever imagine. And they look at it and go, oh my God, I just need a Bible to read. And then there's the NIV and the, and the New King James and the Old King James and, and NASB and the English Standard Version and RSV and all those letters just call them to melt down. And so you need to understand how to guide people into a good translation that can help them meet God in his word. And so this really, really is important um, as you interact with people and help them begin to read the Bible for themselves. Okay, so translations is not an esoteric academic exercise. It's really one of the most important things that we'll ever do for our people as we help them begin to get into God's word. So it's important to study from a good translation. And so by making that statement, I am also making this statement. There are bad translations to study from. Some translations are better than others. It's important for us to help guide people to um, the best translations to study from. Now, notice I'm saying to study from. There are, uh, multiple translations can be used. Some are better just to be read devotionally. 
For instance, I really, really enjoy the message translation. I enjoy reading the voice translation. I enjoy reading some of the um, more contemporary translations that help me devotionally, just as I'm reading for my own personal existential experience of God, then I enjoy those translations. They make reading the Bible fresh and new for me. But when I study God's word, when I'm trying to get thus saith the Lord, when I'm teaching God's word, then I need to go to a good translation and we're gonna talk about kind of how you might do that. So a translation is nothing more than transferring the message of one language Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament written in Greek, some of the Old Testament's written in Aramaic, but not a large part of it, to another language, English. So we're simply going from Hebrew and Greek into English. That's what we call a translation. So we're going to talk a little bit about paraphrases, and a paraphrase is just taking an English translation and writing it in a little bit more readable, understandable, 21st century context, English to English. That's a paraphrase. A translation goes from an old ancient language into our English language, okay? So that's what a translation is, okay? So I need you to know that every translation involves an interpretation. Most people will never know this, but interpretive decisions are made when every Greek scholar or Hebrew scholar takes from the, the ancient text into the 21st century context, they have to make interpretive decisions. I'll give you a couple of examples of how an exegetical process works for a translator who's going from Greek or Hebrew into English, and they have to make interpretive decisions. And so here's an example. The term doulos in Greek, doulos. So in the NIV translation, you're going to see doulos interpreted as servant, as servant. And so um, in some translations, those that are a little bit more literal and I think much closer to the ancient context, the term should be translated slave. So why do you think an, a translator might prefer servant over slave? Well, slave comes with some pretty ugly connotations, right? Slave is a very painful term. It's a very ugly, brutal term. It's a term where a person has no rights. They are owned as property by another person. But if you don't get doulos in its proper translation, then you miss some of the implications when Paul calls himself a slave of Christ, a slave of Christ because slavery was quite prominent in the ancient uh, first century context that Paul writes from. So sometimes doulos is translated as servant when it really needs to be translated as slave. You'll get the term pistis, and pistis is the Greek term for faith. But the term pistis can be translated as faith or faithfulness. Faith or faithful. So it can either refer to faith in Christ or the faithfulness of Christ. And those two translations require interpretations. The translator brings a set of presuppositions and biases to his understanding or her understanding of the text, which causes them to make an interpretation. And so I just need you to know that translations involve interpretation. Another example of this would be the term Messiah. Messiah. Whenever you see the term Messiah in the Bible, it's simply the Greek term for the Old Testament context concept of the Messiah, the anointed one. But the term would better be translated in our contemporary context as king. Every time you say that uh, Christ, Christ, Christ is the Greek term for Messiah, excuse me, Christ is the Greek term for Messiah. And so when every time you say Jesus Christ, you are saying Jesus King. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew term Messiah. And so Christ, you're saying King, okay? Christ, you're saying King, and it's important for you uh, to see that translations involve interpretations. So we didn't have the actual original manuscripts of the Bible. 
That's important for you to know. Nobody has the, the first copy of Genesis or the first copy of the book of Acts, okay? We only have copies of the original manuscript. So that's important for us to keep in mind as we understand how translation and the translation process works. And so all of these copies and manuscripts don't agree word for word. I know that may be shocking to some of you, but all those manuscripts have some slight variations and differences, which leads us to a process of scholarship, uh, which is called textual criticism. And so um, the art and science of studying these manuscripts and seeking which text is likely the original is called textual criticism. Okay, textual criticism. And so um, we're trying to determine out of these various manuscripts, some of them older, some of them newer, meaning some of them can date within 30, 40 years of the life of Jesus and some of them hundreds of years after the life of Jesus. And they have variations within the text. We're trying to determine which text is the most accurate. It's not necessarily always the oldest, but the oldest certainly has some uh, importance to our process of understanding what's the best text for us to be reading from. So we're going to look at textual criticism just briefly right here, just briefly um, in the process here. Textual criticism. When you look for textual criticism, the shorter version is usually the most accurate version. So here's what I want you to know. If you open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 16, it ends in the original manuscript rather abruptly at verse 8. And that troubles translators. That troubled scribes as they, as they copied the book of Mark. And so most scholars would tell you that, that from verse 9 on of chapter 16 in the Gospel of Mark, that those are not a part of the original manuscript. Those are scribal additions adding explanation to the abrupt ending of Mark chapter 16 verse 8. So emendations, that's what verse 9 on in the book of Mark is. Emendations, usually longer, are adding explanations. So usually the longer version is the less original version because people are trying to explain concepts. So this may freak you out a little bit, but in, uh, when Jesus, when we read in, in, I think it's Matthew chapter 17, when uh, the disciples try to cast out a demon and it, they can't cast it out, and they ask Jesus, why can't we cast it out? And, and uh, we read in a verse that says, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. That text is not found in the most original manuscripts. So it just kind of ends with, why can't we cast this demon out? And that bothers the scribes that are copying the text, and they want to say, well, it can only come out by prayer and fasting. So they add some explanation to the text. The harder to understand is usually the best version. So it adds some complexity. So usually when things are getting simpler, that usually means some scribes have been tinkering, trying to make it easier to understand. So there are a fewer texts called Alexandrian texts. These are the earlier texts that we have, Alexandrian texts. And then there's some later texts called Byzantine texts. And these Byzantine texts are the texts that the King James Version came from, which are many hundreds of years later from the actual events, our, old, our later manuscripts as opposed to earlier manuscripts. So that's a little bit about textual criticism, maybe more than you ever really wanted to know about textual criticism. So um, you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew to fully understand the Bible. That's important for you to know, important for us to have confidence to the fact that a lot of times I'll do Greek and Hebrew exegesis and do all of my exegesis and then look at the New American Standard Version or the English Standard Version or some of the better translations and go, well, the word means what the translators have in the, in the text. And so um, we have great scholarship, great translations that are very trustworthy, that are very, very good. And so I often explain it this way. Can, uh, if you put a black and white television and a color television side by side, can you, do they have the same content? Can people see the same story unfolding in the black and white versus the color? And the answer, of, the, of course, they can see the same story. They can see the same characters. They can see the same plot development. But maybe they don't see the nuances quite as easily. They need, and so Greek and Hebrew, having some knowledge of the ancient text and their nuances, can help add some color 
to the picture, but people can read in, the, in these good translations and not miss uh, the major meaning of the text, okay? So we can have confidence there. All right, so here are some different approaches to translation. So this is, gets real kind of practical and technical here, but there are word-for-word -word translations, and uh, my, the translation I typically use to study the Bible in, the New American Standard Bible, this is a word-for-word -word translation, and it's called formal equivalence. So the formal equivalence is, and that's a formal equivalence is a term you'll need to know for your quiz. Formal equivalence is looking directly word for word, word for word translation, okay? So it's, it's called literal or wooden translation because they'll just take the Greek word and try to come up with the closest English word to it, but that English word may not flow real smoothly, it may not be easily read. It may be a little bit um, archaic or difficult to understand, but its translators are trying to be as literal as possible. Then you have this thought for thought is what we call dynamic equivalence or the term that you'll be tested on is functional equivalence. If word for word is formal equivalence, then thought for thought is functional equivalence. And the key thing you need to hear, the key word that tips you off is meaning, meaning. So the NIV is a good example of a thought-for-thought -thought translation. They are trying to stay consistent with the overall meaning without getting caught in the woodenness of the New American Standard. So the meaning, they're trying to be consistent from the meaning of the original text into the meaning into the English text and make it readable, a little bit more easy to read. And then 8.3 here we say a paraphrase is not working from the original languages. So an example of this is the Living Bible did not work from the original languages. It's interesting to know, I didn't know this until recently, that the New Living Bible does go back and work from uh, the original languages. And then it's important for you to realize this. This is one of my pet peeves. So you need to know that Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, that the message is a translation. It's a translation. Eugene Peterson's work from the original Hebrew and Greek. He's just brilliant enough to have done that on his own as an individual and helping his grandkids understand the Bible, but he helped all of us, didn't he? What a great contribution to, uh, to our um, understanding of the Bible and our devotional reading of it. The message is an original language translation, so it's important for you to know that. So um, you can look at this in, uh, when I post the PowerPoint, but this is just kind of a helpful kind of a spectrum. And so um, I prefer the New American Standard Bible, but the English Standard Version and the Revised Standard Version are really good word for word um, translations. And um, you'll see the King James Version here. And we're gonna talk a lot about the King James only debate real quickly here, because you need to be prepared to respond to that. And then over here in a thought for thought, then you're gonna have the NIV translation. And then over here in the paraphrases, you start getting into uh, um, the message paraphrase. And again, paraphrase here, they're using it differently, um, uh, but this would just be more a looser translation, looser translation, more contemporary translation, okay? Then what we, when I use the word paraphrase, I'm meaning English to English. And the message is definitely an original language from Hebrew and Greek to English. So um, that may be a little bit misleading. So our next kind of a diagram, again, this is a different way for you visual people that need to see formal equivalence, functional equivalence, uh, retelling and different kind of translations and where they fit on the spectrum. But this is helpful to some to kind of help um, uh, place these translations. And so, um, you know, if I'm advising people on a Bible to get, um, I don't advise them to get study Bibles. I advise them to get a New American Standard Bible um, or an NIV Bible. NIV is a good um, compromise to do a, a study, but I prefer the New American Standard Bible. Some people prefer the English Standard Version, the ESV. And so, or the New King James, so you can see some of those word-for-word -word equivalents are the best Bibles to do study from. And then if you got the, the, uh, the Bible app, then that's even better, okay? You can get all these translations at your fingertips, which is just awesome, okay? Love technology from that perspective. So um, that's a little example of from formal equivalence 
to functional equivalence and all along the spectrum here. You need to know what an interlinear is. And so I'll bring an interlinear to class and so that you can see it. It is a, a really fun tool to use. It'll take a, uh, it'll have uh, either the, the Hebrew or Greek and then underneath it it'll have English or it'll have the English and underneath it the Hebrew or Greek. And so you get to see just, uh, it's a very wooden, literal kind of, and it doesn't change the word order. It takes the Hebrew or the Greek and then puts the English words in that. In, and so it can be really all over the map, but it helps you kind of uh, see what the Greek and Hebrew uh, is doing. And so um, this is a, a fun thing to see. And those of you who want to get a little bit more into Greek and Hebrew, it helps you to isolate, okay, this Hebrew or English word, and then I can go look it up in, in a different concordance or different Bible study methods tool. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So that's the interlinear. And then um, where translations differ is where interpreters should pay attention. Man, if I could help get that point across to you, one of the best tools that you will ever have in studying the Bible is to use parallel translations. And wherever you see differences in translation, that is where the theological issue is. That is where in translators have to make interpretive decisions, and where they're different shows you that there's a theological issue at play here. And so for those, you don't need Greek and Hebrew to understand where the issues are in the text if you'll just take parallel translations. A great first step in doing any exegesis is simply to take your passage and look at it in as many different translations as possible and note every single difference. A punctuation mark, a different term, a different order, all of those things are surefire tip-offs to where translators encounter some difficult theological issues. And so um, pay attention to parallel translations. All right, fun times. Let's get into the King James Version a little bit here. And so there are those who carry the bias, the presupposition that the King James Version is the only version. <laughs> I find that so humorous. But, but uh, there are those that will argue that everybody should read from the King James Version. So we need to look at that. I need to arm you with this to kind of help you um, diffuse that if you need to. And so um, in 1604, King James uh, authorized a new translation of the Bible, of the whole Bible. So that happened in 1604, and the original King James Version was produced in 1611. And so in that day and age, in the 1600s, they only had access to a few manuscripts, Byzantine texts, that are hundreds and thousands of years away from the original events. So they have the oldest copies of the scripture, by oldest meaning furthest away. For instance, if Jesus lived in 30 AD, they have manuscripts that are done in 1000 AD or 800 AD. And then uh, we have since had better scholarship where we have stuff in the 50s and the 40s AD. So do you see the difference? If you're dealing with a, 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 a um, manuscript that's done in the 800s or the 1000s, versus a manuscript that was done in the 40s or 50s. And so the original translation of the King James Version had very limited access to good manuscripts, okay? And then in 1769, and this is an important linchpin of a conversation with the King James only person, they don't really know that in 1769, there was an update of the 1611 version. Most don't know this. But the 16, in 1769, the version differs in thousands of places from 1611 version. What they did is language changed. In 150 years, our language can change a lot. And so they went and updated the King James Version. So when someone says the King James Version is the only inspired version, it's, it's the, the only version you should ever use, you go, which one? The 1769 or the 1611 version? Okay, and so they usually don't know that. So real quickly here, just a little bit more on the King James only debate. Um, uh, translators of the King James work from inferior Greek text, constructed from only a few late New Testament manuscripts, the Byzantine. And so um, since the King James translation in 1611 and 1769, we have discovered much better manuscript evidence. 
Um, the second reason not to use the King James Version is it's archaic English language. Okay, um, we don't talk with these and vowels in the in the in the old King James language. Uh, some of you may have memorized verses in the King James, and so it's great if you want to continue to read, just because it's hidden in your heart that way. But um, again, there is much better manuscripts, much better translations if we're going to study God's word. And then um, there were big changes from 1611 to 1769 that it's important if you're going to have this debate or argument or discussion with someone who's dead set on the King James Bible version, you can help them understand that they are dealing with some uh, additions or updating. And so why not update to the best manuscript evidence that we have in the world today? So we get better. Everything gets better. We don't drive Model Ts. We drive Lex, uh, uh, Teslas and all sorts of great new gadgets and cars that will almost drive themselves. You don't have to drive a, a Model T. You don't have to ride a bike when you got a motorcycle. So we don't have to stay stuck back in the 1600s when it comes to reading our Bibles. Okay, so it's important to know. So now, uh, again, I want to close this class by um, talking a little bit about assignments. This is your first week, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about how this class is going to work. And so um, your exegetical paper will be from a text in the book of Ephesians. And so um, and I need you to go into um, uh, Brightspace and select your passage, okay? Upload the passage into Brightspace so that I know what passages you guys are using. So that would be helpful. I need you to do that. Okay. Um, the book of Ephesians. And so as we talk about all assignments for this class. And so I love the little bed image here. So they are due by Sunday night at 1159. Sunday night at 1159. Say it with me. Sunday night. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday night at 1159 is when assignments are due. At 12 or 12.01, they are late, late, okay, late. And so um, I've said this before, your character is more important than the content. And so turn something in, turn anything in, just don't not turn something in, okay? It's really, really important, okay? So um, Sunday nights at 11.59, all due dates, and there is grace for one late assignment. So use it well. After that, no exceptions, uh, uh, no excuses. You're just going to suffer the consequences, right? So um, tests and quizzes. And so I've jumped up and down about this already, but I'll just add it one more time. Uh, I'll smile and say it nicely, but absolutely, under no circumstances, open your book, open your notes. I want to know what's in your head. Okay, so uh, all tests and quizzes are um, closed book, closed notes, only what you have up here in your noggin. That's what I want to know. All right. And uh, here's some random exegetical terms. As I finish up this lecture, some random exegetical terms. And uh, the random exegetical terms that you need to be aware of is the term paracope. A pericope is just a Greek name for a section of narrative literature. And so really highfalutin educated people, some lecturers and theologians will say stuff like, turn to the pericope. And so instead of that intimidating you, making you feel dumb, the pericope is just a section of narrative literature. Okay, it may be a chapter or several chapters, the pericope of uh, narrative literature. Number two here, lexical refers to looking up words. A lexicon is a dictionary or picking out a word or doing a word study. This is lexical work. And then syntax. Syntax is important. It refers to how words are combined. Word ordering, syntax, really, really important. How words are combined, how they're used, how they're set up in the text really matters. So Paracope, lexical, and syntax may be words that you would see on a quiz, just so that you would be familiar with those terms. They really, really matter. And so um, that's your first week of hermeneutics. Remember, hermeneutics is an art and a science. Exegesis is an art and a science. Exegesis is the, the actual steps and process that you work through to come up with an interpretation and an application. Okay, of the text. 
And so um, it's important for you to work through McKnight chapters three through five so that you are understand that the Bible is a story, not just statements about God. It's not a systematic theology that's outlined everything you need to know about God, humanity, salvation, eschatology. It's not laid out like that. It's a story. And that's very important that impacts our interpretation, okay? And so um, uh, week two, we're going to look at Gorman chapter three, and we'll look at, uh, I think it is McKnight chapter six to eight, but make sure you check your syllabus for uh, the, the chapters. And so I can't wait to be with you live and in person for week two, uh, Bible 2623. So have a blast, and I will see you soon.